I will tell you, you know, really, the desire to continue eating animal products has clouded some of the most intelligent minds in human history. It's, really, it's astounding, okay? But Bentham was not an idiot. Um, and, and how did he then, how did he then um, get to that point and say, what matters is suffering, you can't exclude suffering any more than you can, and you can't focus on species to exclude suffering any more than you can focus on race to exclude suffering. How does he not get to the idea that we, we have to stop exploiting animals altogether? Interestingly, Bentham was opposed to slavery. So he said, you know, slavery is bad. Okay? He thought slavery was really bad because he thought that the interests of slaves would always be given, if you had slavery, the interests of slaves would always be given less weight. They would always be treated as non-equal because their interests would kill them because they don't know what the hell it is they're losing. They have no concept of what they're losing, so it doesn't matter what, what, whether you kill them. What matters is not making them suffer. Okay, so this is what he says. Now, you know, I'm sorry, and we'll get to this in a few minutes, but you know, really, is that good? Because I mean, anyway, well, let me let me get and and and. and just, just so lest you sort of not dump on Sir Jeremy, um, that really is not functionally different from the position of Peter Singer. I mean, Peter Singer was like, you know, the father of the animal rights movement. Um, uh, you know, Singer takes a, a very similar position. Basically, he says, well, they're non-human great apes and elephants and dolphins or whatever. They might be cognitively similar to us, and they might have, they might be self-aware in some of the ways, in, in, in a similar way to the way we're self-aware. Um, but he says that you know the, the the animals that we routinely exploit, particularly chickens. He's got this thing about chickens, um, and you know he says that that chickens basically you know they don't have a concept of a life. Um, if you kill them, it's really not a tra it's not a tragedy in the sense of the way when you kill um, a human being. You know I mean I guess you have to ask the chicken about that. But but um, but uh, you know so so Bentham's views that an animals don't have an interest in continuing to live. They just have an interest in not suffering. Um, allows him to say animal interests matter, okay? But it's all right for us to continue using them because we're not hurting them when we kill them as long as we do it painlessly. I'm sorry, this is my eighth, eighth talk in two days, and um, my throat is killing me. So, um, as a matter of fact, John, I may need more water. I, I'll, I'll try to stretch it out, but I may. Um, uh, in any event, so. Um, and this, this thinking gives rise to the, to the animal welfare movement. Because right after you know, this thinking starts proliferating and, 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 and going through society, um, you start seeing anti-cruelty laws and legislation to stop various sorts of things and blah, 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 blah. And now we've got anti-cruelty laws all over the place. Canada's got them, United States got them, everybody's got them. Everybody has anti-cruelty laws. They are, and, and what's interesting is the crimin the, most of these things are criminal laws. And criminal law, the criminal code, is only supposed to have in it the things that we generally agree on are wrong. Because the theory is if you put too much stuff into the criminal code, you encourage disrespect for the criminal law. You, want, you really want the criminal law to reflect, reflect what, what the, the society really thinks is morally odious. So we put murder, and we put rape, and we put burglary, and we put, you know, we put a lot of property crimes and stuff like that because we, we fetishize property. But, but we, you know, and, 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 but in the criminal code, we find these anti-cruelty laws, okay? So it, that says something. It says that we take this stuff seriously. We, we regard these moral norms as important. The problem is the animal welfare approach that allows us to distinguish ourselves from Michael Vick and, you know, and allows us to feel comfortable about continuing to exploit animals is an approach which cannot work in a number of different respects. First of all, Bentham's view was you can continue using them, but you have to provide protection. He was a big believer in legislation. You've got to provide legal rules that protect these animals and, protect, you know, and ensure their humane treatment. That can't work, and it can't work for the following reasons. Reason: Animals are chattel property. They are property. They have, they have no inherent or intrinsic value. They only have extrinsic, external value, the value that we accord them. You, I asked you before about how many people uh, had uh, 
not human companion. And um, I'm sure you love your animals. I'm sure that you do. Um, and I'm sure that you regard them as members of your family. Um, but the reality is they're your property. And one of the incidents of property ownership is the state allows you to determine how to value your own personal property. So if you wish to value your dog, and, or your cat, or your, you know, whatever, and, and you want, if you wish to afford a high value today, you can do that. If you want to afford a low value and keep your dog outside on a chain and use your guard dog as a guard dog, never show your dog any affection, and you know, just provide the minimal food and, 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 and water and shelter to that animal, you can do that too. As a matter of fact, you can all go home tonight and decide, you know what, having an animal is really a pain in the neck, and you can take that animal to a kill shelter where if they can't find another home, they will kill them. Or, in many places, you can kill them yourself. Or, you can take them to a veterinarian and say, I no longer wish to be burdened with this property ownership. Kill my dog, kill my cat, and you can get a dead animal. Okay? And so, yeah, you don't regard your dog or your cat or your bird or whatever we're talking about here as property, but the reality is the law does, and that means that you have the ultimate d decision as to how much weight you're going to attach to the value of that, to, to the interests of that animal. You are the one who determines the valuation of that animal's interest. And if you decide to value those interests at zero, you may take the animal to a shelter and say, find another home, if not, kill the dog. I value this, the dog's life at zero. You can do that. It's called property ownership. Animals are chattel property. Thanks an awful lot. Animals are chattel property. They have no value except that which we give them. And one of the one of the things that and, and, and it costs money to protect animal interests. It costs money. And so we generally, and this is one of the things that I found when I wrote Animals Pro Property of the Law many years ago, was I, I looked at um, British and American law from the 19th century into the 20th century. And what I concluded was when we write, you know, when we when we protect animal interests, we generally do so only when we get an economic benefit from doing so. So, you know, we have legislation which requires that large animals be rendered uh, unconscious before they're, they're shackled and moisted and cut in a slaughterhouse. Well, why do we have that rule? We have that rule because, I mean, animals have all sorts of interests that we don't protect. Why do we protect the interest of the animal at the moment of death? Well, for, for one reason, when an animal that weighs 2,000 pounds is hanging upside down by one leg, they move around a lot, mostly because their pelvises break, um, and they're in a lot of pain, and they're freaking out, um, and they move around a lot, and you know what happens? Workers get injured. Uh-oh, money, that costs, they've got lawsuits. Um, and then what else happens? We have carcass damage. And, 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 and the result of carcass damage, cows, pigs, you know, uh, calves and whatnot, these are expensive pieces of property, right? And so when you have carcass damage to one of these animals, that reduces the economic value of the animal. So if you've got the animal unconscious, at least so that the animal's not moving around, because actually, in, in, in point of fact, a lot of times in slaughterhouses, animals are not completely unconscious, but they may be unconscious in most cases, at least enough so that they're not moving around a lot. You reduce carcass damage, and, and, and you reduce worker injury, which is why, by the way, when the United States uh, um, uh, passed this law in 1958, they excluded chicken. Why? Because everybody thought, well, you know, it's a hell of a little chicken, you know, I mean, they're hanging upside down, and, and, and they're not going to, if they bump into workers, they're not going to injure workers, and they're not going to incur carcass damage. Now there's this big campaign that groups like People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals and the Humane Society of the United States are saying, let's get chickens covered under the Humane Slaughter Act. And the arguments they're making, okay, the arguments they're making are taken from agricultural economists who have demonstrated that the present method of killing chickens, which is unbelievably horrible, uh, but the present method of killing chickens results in a huge amount of carcass damage. And there are worker injuries because you've got various parts of the, the killing process uh, that present hazards to workers. And, and so there are worker injuries. But the carcass damage in the traditional chicken killing, uh, chicken processing plant is very high. So the argument is, look, you could save a lot of money. I mean, the reality is if you were starting a chicken processing plant tomorrow and you didn't use what PETA is recommending, that is controlled atmospheric killing, you would be out of your mind because that's the economically rational thing to do. It costs a lot less money to kill that way. 
You have a lot, lot less carcass damage. You can employ fewer people to do it. You just gas the chickens. Okay? Sometimes some people do it in the truck. You know, they got the chickens, they take the chickens from the from the hen house, they put them in a truck, and then they put the pipe inside the truck, and then they gas the chickens. Okay? That's a much, much cheaper way of doing it, a much easier way of doing it. Does it have anything to do with justice? I think not. Does it have anything to do with recognizing that animals have inherent value? I think not. It has to do with money. It has to do with bottom line. It has to do with business. Which is why, for example, in Canada, PETA's campaign against Kentucky Fried Chicken got Kentucky Fried Chicken to agree that over a period of years, of like 8,000 years, they're going to phase in. They're going to, you know, these things, these things always, I'll get to that in a second. Um, these things are always phased in over very long periods of time, right? And the reason why they're phased in is because most of the things that PETA and HSUS and Mercy for Animals and all these organ all these charities are, are promoting are things that are economically inefficient, that industry is going to change anyway. But because of economic, you know, like I've got a lot of money. Right now I've got a lot of money tied up in my, in my chicken killing plant. And I'm also getting tax advantages every year. You know, I'm expensing this stuff out, I'm depreciating the property, blah, 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 blah. At some point in time, I'm going to take all the tax, I won't get any more tax advantages, and I'm going to have to replace the equipment because the equipment's becoming obsolete. And when I do that, I'm going to go to a controlled atmosphere killing, because it's a killing situation. I'm going to gas the chickens because that's what a rational person would do. Okay? So, and that's why they're, they phase these things in because most of the time, these campaigns, that these organizations are promoting are things that industry is in the process of phasing out anyway because it's just economically inefficient. And so they do this kabuki dance. So the animal people say, oh, you gotta gas the chickens. And then industry, industry always resists, no matter what, they always resist because they have to resist. They have to, whenever you challenge industry, a regulated industry, okay, the regulated industry almost always will resist even if ultimately they plan to make the change because they've got to impose an opportunity cost, some opportunity cost, on the person demanding the change or else people might start demanding changes that they don't want to make. So you get the animal people, you got to gas the chickens. Kentucky Fried Chicken in Canada says, no, 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 we're going to continue to kill them the way we want to kill them. And then, you know, PETA sends out 8,000 pieces of mail, please, please help, you know, and then you give them the money and they, you know, and then eventually, eventually, um, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken in Canada says, yes, we're going to, we've agreed with our suppliers, because what happens is Kentucky Fried Chicken contracts out with 80 million different chicken farms, and they, they get, that's how they get the birds. And so Kentucky Fried Chicken says, we are going to contract, as, 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 over a period of years, we're going to phase out and we're going to require that our suppliers gas their chickens. PETA says, victory! Then they go back to you and say, give us money, because um, <laughs> we, we've been victorious. And, and, and they praise Kentucky Fried Chicken. Kentucky Fried Chicken looks great. Okay, it's like, we care about animal welfare. We really do eat our chicken. Um, and, and you do it. I mean, that's what people do. I mean, you know, I mean, that's what people do. I mean, I remember when Kentucky Fried Chicken in Canada made that announcement a couple years ago. I remember, because uh, it was covered in the States, I remember one of my colleagues um, at the university said to me, Gee, he said, I see what they did in Canada. He said, I think it's terrible the way they kill the chickens. I'm really hoping that they'll do that in America, too, so I can feel good about eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. And, and you know what? As crazy as that sounds, I mean, that's what we have right now, is we have, you know, there are people, lots of them, who think that we satisfy our moral obligations to animals by going to Whole Foods and buying, you know, uh, animal welfare rated step three, you know, a, you know meat, or you know, or happy milk, or happy cheese, or happy. And the bottom line, I mean, but 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 that's that's what's going. I mean, you know, I I I've written a, a great deal about it, indeed, um, post almost weekly, at least once, um, on my Facebook site. Um, the letter that was written in 2005, signed by Peter Singer, uh, along with People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, uh, the Humane Society of the United States, Mercy for Animals, uh, Compassion Over Killing, and just about every large animal organization in North America, a letter to John Maggie, CEO of Whole Foods, saying, we express our, and this is a quote, appreciation and support, end quote, for the, quote, pioneering, end quote, animal compassionate labeling program. So, so what message does this send to the public? 
You know, what message does it send to the public? What it says is animal people are saying it's okay to eat animals. And when the animal groups say, oh, no, we're not saying that. We're just saying less suffering is better than more suffering. No, 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 sorry. What the public is hearing is that there are morally acceptable ways to exploit. And that's what they're responding to. And that's why that market is going nuts. John Mackey's a brilliant business. He's a brilliant businessman. What he's done is he's created a niche market, which is growing. It's, stop, it's, not, it's no longer a niche market. It's becoming a very large market. What he's doing is he's catering to those of us, those people in society who have real moral concern about animals, who, thinks it's, who, think it's, you know, who are really uncomfortable about this. And what he's doing, it's like the Catholic Church selling indulgences. If you want to sin, you can sin. Yeah, um, you know, but just, just come and, you know, yes, if you want to commit adultery, give us a donation. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, but it's, it's basically, um, you know, John Mackey is saying, I can provide happy, exploit, uh, happy exploitation products to you. And you got all these animal organizations saying, yeah, this is a good thing. We express our appreciation and support. I don't know how the hell that doesn't translate into normative approval.